International Museum of Industrial History. Thank you again for coming today. Um, I want to, uh, it's actually my honor to introduce our speaker for today's talk. Mark Connor is a retired businessman with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Anthropology and International Relations from Brown University, postgraduate degree in Archaeology at the University Museum from the University of Pennsylvania, Mark also holds an MBA from Lehigh University. He's participated in archeological archeolo surveys in the United States and the United Kingdom, and has had a lifelong interest in historical and industrial archeology. span Working alongside a team of passionate and knowledgeable volunteers, Mark has extensively researched the Friedensville zinc mines, particularly the 19th century mines and the landmark President Pumping Engine. This team is working with the National Museum of Industrial History and other organizations to preserve and restore the memory of the President Engine and the mines. Mark is also working with Lehigh University, the owner of the Stabler Pathways property, to undertake steps to stabilize, repair, preserve, and make publicly available the unique engine ruins and surrounding landscape as a heritage park or other suitable protective environment. Mark is active in the community serving on, there's a long list, <laughs> Sorry. serving on board of trustees for Historic Bethlehem Museum and Sites. He's a founding member here of the National Museum of Industrial History. He's also on the board of friends of Lehigh University Libraries, a member of the Oliver Evans Church of the Society for Industrial Archaeology, the Mining History Association, the Cornish American Heritage Society, the Trevethick Society, the International Stationary Steam Engine Society, the Lower Saucon Township Historical Society, and the Sons of the American Revolution. This is most impressive. In 2022, Mark was named a Cornish bard. His name in Cornish is Gin, which means engine, by the, uh, by the Corseth Kernow, the preeminent Cornwell UK Heritage Society in recognition of his services to promote Cornish cultural identity in America. Please join me in welcoming Mark Hunter. Thanks, Kara. Uh, <laughs> Did I get some of these? Well, yeah, I, I had to check my phone and just be sure. My, my best friend doesn't call me potential spam. Uh, <laughs> Um, well, thank you for coming out on a, finally, a cold February winter's day. Uh, we don't get those too often, so. Are you hearing me all right through this? Okay, perfect. Uh, the talk today is on the recreating the President Pumping Engine. And you'll see two pictures up there. One is uh, from a stereo view, uh, 18, you know what a stereo view is? I think most of you guys would probably re recognize a stereo view back in the before TV and back before uh, movies, and you wanted to invite a friend over to your house, you'd say, come over to my parlor and we can watch our stereo views. And you, <laughs> you put them out like this on a machine and it becomes 3D, right? Well, the picture on the, uh, on the left is a stereo view, and the one on the right was made in 2020 by, uh, by a, a gentleman who we're working with who made an animated movie of the President Engine, and we'll watch that movie in today's presentation. So, really see the, pre the presentation's really got three parts here. First, I wanna just get some background information. I know this may be a uh, repeat for, for a number of you who've heard this before, but I think it's important that everybody gets a basic understanding of what is the Friedensville Mines and the President Engine. And once we go through that, we'll talk about what we've been doing to recreate the engine and then lastly, what we're doing to preserve the site where the engine was once located. So let's start in the beginning. How about what is zinc, right? Uh, the mines in Friedensville are for zinc. Uh, zinc is the fourth most commonly mined metal in the world. Uh, it's spalerite is the common zinc ore. And it's really used for traditionally, and I say traditionally, that's before the 20th and 21st centuries, it was used for, uh, in, in medicine, but also as a brass alloy. Brass is a combination of copper and zinc. 
uh, as a pain additive was a, was a major early use in the 19th century, and as anti-corrosion plating, uh, galvanizing. So more newer uses, uh, 21st century uses, if you will, 20th century uses, late 20th century aerospace, lithium battery, batteries, and it's actually now considered to be a green metal because it's used extensively in uh, solar and wind uh, powered equipment. Uh, that's not to say that the mining of zinc is green, but, uh, but certainly the use is green and it's an essential component. In, and it's not, it's not rare. Uh, zinc can be found in a number of places in the world. So, at Friedensville, we have actually two main types of zinc ore. We have oxidized ore, or sometimes called calamine. Uh, this is an example of a calamine ore. It's not... Uh, not from Friedensville. I've been over to the Friedensville site probably a hundred times. I've yet to find an example of uh, oxidized ore there. Uh, it was on the surface. It has a high zinc content, and it was, you know, that was what was mined first. So, uh, so there's really, I'm sure there are some examples buried there, but uh, I've not found them yet. I'll pass that around. You can see what it looks like. Again, that sample is from Mexico, not uh, not Friedensville. And the other. Um, the other uh, way it's found is as um, spalerite, and uh, that's usually deeper down in the uh, mine. It also, the, the zinc content of, uh, of the ore is less, but uh, both of these were mined extensively in the 19th century. In fact, at the end of the day, it was mostly the blend that was mined, which again, it's comes, it shows up here is a sample. This is a core sample from Friedensville, of, and you can see the lines. It, it's in limestone, right? The country rock is limestone, so it comes out as a, a, a gray or line in a gray country rock. This is, a, again, a sample from Friedensville, which is just limestone. So I, I guess the message here is you can, you um, really have to, um, be pretty good to know where to mine and get ore because think about it, you're underground or you're trying to go through horizontal drifts, falling veins, and from the very earliest days of these mines, Cornish engineers were involved. You're going to hear about Cornwall a lot, but from the beginning of the mines in the 19th century to the end, the mine captain or superintendent of the mine was Cornish. A lot of the key people were, were Cornish because the owners of the mine, principally Quaker, Philadelphia and Quaker investors, wanted somebody that they knew if they were going to go after this ore, they were going to go in the right places and they weren't going to end up with a lot of this instead of a lot of this. So it was, um, you know, that their expertise in hard rock mining was important to, uh, to running the business. You know, I just want to pass those around, you can get a sense of it. So it all started here. This, if you're from the local area, you'll recognize this house. It's in uh, on Old Bethlehem Pike. Uh, it uh, has a very large sycamore tree in the front. The tree must be as old as the house. It must be, you know, 150, 200 years old. And this was the home of a farmer by the name of Jacob Uberoth. And he, starting in the 1830s, he was pretty disappointed with his farm because the land was infertile. He had all these rocks on it. They wouldn't burn in his kiln. He couldn't figure out what they were. So um, uh, he kept trying to go around, taking it to different places. Nobody could really figure it out. Until one day, uh, a fellow by the name of Theodore Roper came along. And uh, he saw the farmer in the field and said, uh, well, what's the, the guy talking? He said, well, we have these rocks. I can't figure out what they are. I said, well, I'm a chemist. Let me go see if I can figure it out. Took it back to a foundry in Bethlehem and combined this calamine, it was the calamine type ore. He combined it with, um, uh, with, with copper and they were able to produce brass. So he knew it was zinc, right? So great, they now they know they have zinc. Now the problem was, this is 1845, there wasn't a US process to make zinc from zinc ore. Um, and there just wasn't a process in the States to do that. Any zinc oxide that was imported, and it was being imported at the time principally for paint because it was recognized that zinc 
uh, oxide was a better additive for paint than lead. It, it, it produced a whiter paint, it was easier to cover, it was less poisonous. Uh, so it was all being imported from Europe. And um, so there really wasn't a process to do it here. But starting in the early 1850s, a fellow by the name of Samuel Wetherill, again, a Philadelphia Quaker family, his family had a lot of investments in, uh, in paint business and in other businesses, mines, so, so they were you know, well connected. But he was a chemist, and he developed a process to produce zinc oxide directly from zinc oil. Now, I like to say that uh, Friedensville and, uh, or if you will, Friedensville and Bethlehem is a birthplace of the zinc industry. I know as people, we all have one birthplace, but I think industries can have multiple ones. And um, Weatherall was working first in Jersey, in North Jersey, when he came up with this process to take um, zinc ore and turn it into zinc oxide. He didn't have much luck with the Sussex County, New Jersey zinc deposits, but he had great fortune when he was able to use the deposits from Freedensville. So he had this patented process now. He made a deal personally, not, not through his company, but personally made a deal to, uh, to use the ores from uh, Freedensville. Took it to his New Jersey employer and said, hey, I got a process, a patented process, and I do have ores, why don't we make a deal? And they didn't come to a deal. They said, you know, they couldn't agree. In fact, I think they told us something to the effect, well, you came over that process in our, in our plant, so you really, we really own it. He said, no, that's not the case. Anyway, he walked out the door, came to Bethlehem, and uh, in 1853, he, he, built a plant, he built a plant in South Bethlehem where Faye Bridge is, is now, to, um, to, to smelt or make the zinc oxide, the zinc oxide bag plant. And they started mining zinc in Freedensville. So that was 1853. Uh, Weatherall was a, a creative guy, an inventor, terrible businessman, plant burned down. A fellow by the name of uh, uh, Joseph Wharton uh, came in. Joseph Wharton became quite famous later on. In fact, he became the wealthiest industrialist in America uh, by the end of the 19th century. But this was his first, uh, first venture. He came in, turned the place around. Very successful, particularly during the Civil War. Uh, however, by 1876, the mines shut down. Uh, largely, a couple of reasons. One was economic conditions, another was it was expensive to produce ore from Freedensville because uh, there's a lot of water there. And they, you know, getting rid of the water was, was made the cost stack expensive. And there was also some patent issues where the patents ran out. And so anyway, the mine shut down in 1876. Uh, they reopened under new management in 1881 and then ran until 1893. And uh, at that point, the mines all closed, the 19th century mines closed. So that we have up there, here I guess if I want to do the pointer, where's that on, is that on the nose of this thing? Ooh, well, uh, no, that's not it. It should be in the center. In the center. In the center of the. Okay, okay. Yeah. No. Uh, well, I don't have to experiment with that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There you go. There it is. How do I get my slideshow back up? Uh, I learned a lesson there. Okay, that's good. So, um, thanks, Kara. <laughs> thanks, Andrea. Um, so anyway, mine shut down 1893. 1899, New Jersey Zinc Company bought the mines. However, they, they were in the process of great consolidation. This was the time of the monopolies. and They basically didn't buy the mine or run the mine, they bought the mine so that they had the ore in reserve so maybe someday they would um, would, uh, would you know, exploit the ores from the mine or maybe they just didn't want it on the market, you know, to help their monopolistic position. So so they, they had no near-term intentions of reopening the mine. But they did open the mines, you know, 50 or 50 years later. In 1958, uh, New Jersey Zinc opened mines in Freedensville. They're all underground, uh, whereas the 19th century mines were open pit with uh, horizontal drifts going out from the open pits. Uh, in the case of um, the 20th century mines, they were all underground. And um, they operated from, uh, from uh, 
they really started to develop the mine in, right after World War II, but they didn't really open the mine until 1958 and then ran until 1983. So the production from these mines, it was about 250 tons in the 19th century and the zinc concentration in that because this was surface ores as well as the, the pit uh, from the mine pits was, uh, was about 30% uh, zinc. In the case of the 20th century, and in both cases they ran for about 25 years, and in the 20th century the zinc production was much more, but the concentration of zinc was much less because New Jersey zinc was mining down 2,000 feet below the surface and the zinc concentration just wasn't, wasn't as high. So, Friesville mines have been called the wettest mines in America. In fact, putting them up there, they, they would be in the top 10 wettest mines in the world. And uh, here are two photographs, both from the 20th century, showing the amount of water that they had to contend with. Uh, 19, that one picture on the left is from 1950, and on the right is from uh, 1976 when they had an outbreak and got 60,000 gallons a minute of water coming into the mine. They had to close all the bulkheads to save the equipment. Um, two quotes there from the 19th century. The water had to be fought by the pumps for every foot sunk and every minute of the life of the mine. And uh, or to put the matter another way, the water following into the shaft would fill to a depth of 27 feet in 15 minutes. So the amount of water that they had to deal with was, uh, was really incredible. So you're a 19th century investor and you have um, a water problem like this. Who do you call? You know, who do you call? Or telegraph, I guess, as the case may be, or send a courier letter. Well, you call that Cornish guy, right? <laughs> The uh, mine captains were, were Cornish, the leads in the mine were Cornish, but in addition to having extraordinary experience in hard rock mining, the Cornish were also experts in steam technology as it relates to, particularly as it relates to mine applications. Why is that? Well, if you think about Cornwall, you think, if you know where it is, it's the little boot at the, at the le left side and bottom of uh, Great Britain. And it has about, um, it's rich in ore, rich in copper and tin. In fact, half the world's production of copper and tin in the 19th century came from Cornwall. But it doesn't have much in the way of running water. So, you know, back before steam, how did you do things? You know, you did use water, you use horses and you used uh, water wheels, right? Well, they didn't have much in the way of stream. So when steam technology started to be developed in the 17th, late 17th century, early 18th century, they were early adopters of steam technology, particularly for mine pumping applications. And along with uh, some of the famous names in steam technology like Newcomen, James Wash, there's Richard Trevethick, who's a Cornishman and others. So they, they developed quite a capability in use of steam technology in mining applications. So, a guy by the name of John West came to, came to uh, Friedensville. He brought a team, a master builder, operators, all from Cornwall, and, the, and he was given a challenge. You've got to solve our water problem. And he designed this massive machine. It was beyond anything that had been built before in terms of scale and size. It was, uh, has two lattice foot beams, 36 inches end to end. The, uh, it's a single cylinder engine, so the single cylinder is 110 inches in diameter, over nine feet. Uh, they say they actually laid it on its side and had a banquet in it uh, halfway through the construction. Um, 3,000 horsepower, uh, 30 foot flywheels, so it, it required 20, 20 steam uh, boilers to operate. Um, so it was burning about 800 tons of coal uh, a month. And uh, it ran continuously from 1872 to 1876, it, with all, pretty much without a hitch. It didn't uh, had one very minor breakdown, and then ran again uh, from 1881 to 1890. Late 1891, <coughs> one of the beams broke, and um, at this point the mine was having uh, financial issues. Uh, they tried a whole bunch of other pumps to to lower the water back in the mine. They couldn't do it. The mine just filled with water. 
and it closed in 1893. So, you know, simply said, this was the largest and most powerful single cylinder steam engine ever made anywhere in the world before or after. So it was, uh, uh, it really was a landmark, uh, uh, a landmark invention. It was capable of drawing 17,000 gallons of water a minute from a depth of 300 feet. So that's uh, the background. And um, now we're going to talk about what we've done to recreate this uh, uh, marvelous invention, if you will, mammoth engine. And I have a quote here from a fellow by the name of Vartan Gregorian. He was actually the uh, president of my university, Brown. But he really got his, um, he's really famous because he headed up the New York library system at a time when the New York library system was failing and uh, really revived it, if you will. And I'm just going to let you read the quote and, and uh, think about it, actually. But it's, uh, it's been very meaningful to me. I, I would like to thank all the people, all the archivists and, uh, and, and all the museum staff who have helped us with this journey. But I'm afraid if I started using names, I'd forget some, and then I'd be bad. I'd feel bad about that. But um, a couple of people I do have to mention, uh, Damien Nance, uh, Dr. Damien Nance is a professor of geology at, um, uh, well, at Yale and also at uh, Ohio University. And he is also the world's leading knowledge expert when it comes to Cornish pumping engines. He's written a definitive book about Cornish engines in Cornwall. Uh, he lives here in the States, in Connecticut. but. Um, and, and he's been a mentor to me and also a, a great help in understanding of all of this. Um, uh, Jerry Lennon at Lehigh University has helped engage the students at Lehigh, which uh, and they've done a, a project uh, on, the, on the engine, and that's been, been very useful in, in helping to engage Lehigh. Uh, uh, Michael Cause from uh, Virginia, who has written the definitive study of the Freedomsville Mines, has worked uh, closely with me. Uh, so, uh, and Bob Landing in St. Louis, Missouri, who was a kid, his father was chief engineer in the New Jersey zinc mine, so he knows the mines inside and out. He's been in all the tunnels, caves, and uh, Bob has uh, really helped us understand the site. And last but not least, I have to say Aaron Kinzer, I don't know if I mentioned him, but Lehigh University owns the property. Aaron heads up the real estate group, and she has been an incredible supporter. So now that I think I've given the credits I need to give, I'm going to just uh, move on to what have we done. Well, in order to reconstruct the president engine, first let's talk about what we didn't have. We didn't, we didn't have, the engine house is a ruin. You see a picture of it up on the top there. It's um, right there, right? No, I know how to use the point. Um, and the uh, engine itself was scrapped in 1900. So there's nothing left of the engine apart from a single steam boiler that survived. But apart from that, the engine itself is gone. We have no original drawings of the engine, although we do know that um, in uh, 1984, when New Jersey Zinc closed the doors, the, the drawings existed. We know they existed, but they were lost. Nobody can find them. So we keep hoping that they're in somebody's attic somewhere and they'll show up. No photographs. Nobody ever took a photograph of it that we know of. And uh, any information on the Boiler House has been pretty sketchy. So that's uh, what we don't know. What we do know is what we've learned from, uh, from archival collections. And we do have um, the ruins of the engine house. Again, yes, that's bad. But you have to remember, this was what they call a house-built engine. And that engine house was never used for anything other than to support that engine. So if you go inside the engine house ruins, you can see these nooks and crannies here and there, and you can get an understanding of where, how, where and how the engine fit within the engine ruins. Um, specifications of the engine, Arabian Church Archives has the written specifications of the engine. The, uh, we have engravings and documentations, largely from technical journals. And student theses, back in uh, the 19th century, an engineering students had to write theses uh, to graduate. And a number of students wrote theses on the Friedensville Mines. One a student in particular uh, at Lafayette wrote a thesis on the engine, and he, in he included drawings of the engine. Uh, there were five or six drawings, and they obviously were taken from the, uh, 
from the original drawings. I mean, that's just pretty clear. So, so those, those have been of great help to us. And then lastly, uh, uh, exterior photographs, uh, for example, like this one from, uh, from the Library of Congress where stereo views of Friedensville Mines, uh, they have a collection of stereo views of the mines. So all this information has been able to pull together to uh, create a wonderful display on the President Engine, which is right over there where I'm pointing, right on the other side of that door. And um, uh, when I first, decided, thought, first got into this and thought about where do I want to have a display on the President Engine, um, my first, second, and third choice was the National Museum of Industrial History, because this is the place to tell the story. And, uh, so uh, it's beyond my wildest thanks that the university, uh, that the, the, the uh, National Museum of Industrial History has uh, has been so willing a participant in all of this. I, I can't thank them enough. Um, but the centerpiece of this display is a model. This is a model of the engine made by a fellow by the name of Anthony Mont. He took our information. The way this started is um, I mentioned Damian Nance. Well, he has a brother named Johnny. And uh, Johnny, in, 19, in 2017, went to the Bampton Charter Fair in Bampton, Devon, England, and um, got talking to a guy there, Tony Mont. And he, I guess Tony said, well, your name is Nance, blah, 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 blah. He said, by any chance, you know Damien Nance? And he said, yeah, he's my brother. <laughs> and so, well, I've always, I saw an article that Damien wrote in, for the Trevethic Society about the president engine in America. I'd love to be able to model that engine. And so Dame, Johnny got with Damien, Damien got with me, and that started a five-year progress of putting together that engine model. So we started in 2017, finished it, and was delivered here in April of, of uh, 2022. So it was a five-year project. Um, the Bampton Charter Fair, by the way, was started by, uh, in the reign of King John of Magna Carta fame. It got its, um, uh, it became a chartered uh, fair in 1258, and um, it's been running continuously since then. This is a little aside. It actually even ran in 2020 when you had the coronavirus. Of course, you're just like the states, people couldn't get together in 2020. So in England, you could only, three people could get together. That was it. So the um, town crier, the, the lord of the manor, and the city councilor got together and opened the fair uh, and in a matter of 15 minutes, closed the fair. They just opened the fair long enough that they could take the tribute that you have to do every year to the Lord of the Manor to give it to him, and then they closed the fair. So they can say that they've run this fair continuously for over 800 years. So anyway, that was a bit of an aside. <laughs> but uh, please check out, if you haven't already, please check out this model. It's uh, in a beautiful mahogany stand. It's mostly made of uh, mild steel and cast iron and uh, painted green. We actually don't know what color the present engine was painted or if it was painted at all. But normally back then, stationary engines were painted green because it's a color you could see in a dark room. So, Another um, again, part of our display is a uh, drawing by, a artist, by Alex Carnes. Uh, Alex Carnes is a a yeah, young fellow who is well known to the museum, he has worked on the big green machine in there, helped uh, put it together, install it. He's a, he's a mechanical genius. He's gone all around the world working on steam engines. And in addition to his mechanical engineering skills, he's also an extremely accomplished artist, graphic artist. I've watched him make this drawing of the president engine. He, he doesn't even use a straight edge. It's, it's all pencil drawn. Um, but we wanted this because it allows us to paint the engine. Tony's model is great to look at the engine itself, but this allows us to take the engine and then put it within the context of the building that was its structure. And um, Alex has done a great job of doing that. Uh, you can see him. He actually put himself in the drawing. There he is. But it gives us scale. <laughs> this bird over here does not give us scale. That's some prehistoric bird that he put there. <laughs> he likes birds, in fact. There's, you'll see here, there's a little chip here and a little chip there. You'll notice that when you look at the original, that's from his parrot. Um, either he was 
not giving the parrot enough attention or not feeding him or whatever. But anyway, a uh, parrot uh, decided to have his, have his or her way with the drawing while it was being done, but too late to start over, if you will, you know? So, and lastly, and what I really want to focus on today is a movie that was made. Guy Jansen in uh, Belgium <coughs> saw a presentation that uh, we put on for the uh, Friends of the Lehigh Library. So it was online, and he got a hold of us and said, that engine really fascinates me. I'd like to make an animated model of it. And he's done quite a few uh, of the Newcomen engines, the Watts engines, um, many other uh, steam engines. He's a nuclear engineer, but again, he has a passion around steam engine technology. So over a course of a year, we fed Guy information. Guy, it, it was pretty much daily that we were putting together this movie. And now we're going to see if we can run. This is the, this is where it gets interesting. You're going to hear music. This is um, this is actually by a by a American composer from the 1870s and uh, called. visitor to the mine.
a good plant tour there, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, I, when I started this project, I never thought that we would get to a position we could actually give a plant tour or something that's no longer there. But it's amazing what they can do today with uh, animation and restoration of information. So um, if you'd like to see the rest of the movie, that's the short version. There's a longer version that's a half an hour. And that will actually go into the details, you know, here really want to take that, slice the engine apart and go inside and do an autopsy of how it worked, all the pistons moving up and down and all the uh, you know, condenser and so forth. You can do that. It's on our website, um, but uh, for the purpose of presentation, I keep it to the, to the, say, the less technical version. So now we're going to switch gears to the last part of the, of the talk and really, you know, focus now on what are we doing uh, relative to the, the site itself. Um, we're of the view that, that saving the site is uh, critically important for, for a variety of reasons. One is uh, it's really the uh, one of the few remnants left of perhaps the earliest modern age industrial uh, business, in, in, certainly in Bethlehem and one of the earliest in the Lehigh Valley. The uh, zinc industry here in the south side Bethlehem was uh, there before the steel industry. It uh, started up a couple years before Bethlehem Iron Company. Uh, it had state-of-the-art patented technology, employed 700 people. It was a, it was a big business. And uh, it's also, as we discussed, it's also a birthplace of the zinc industry overall. So that's more of a, uh, has more national implications as opposed to just regional. Uh, secondly, uh, we talked about the engine. The engine is a landmark engine. It is the largest single cylinder stationary steam engine ever built anywhere. And then lastly, the engine house ruins themselves are unique because they are the only surviving example of a Cornish style engine house in the United States. Uh, in Cornwall, there's about 200 of these that survive and they're the basis of a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, I firmly believe that in 2006 when Cornwall got its um, inscription as a World Heritage Site, if they had known about Freedomsville at the time, it would have been part of their narrative because uh, a lot of their uh, um, application talked about the Cornish engines that were elsewhere in the world because the basis of their uh, World Heritage status is the influence that Cornish miners have had uh, globally. Uh, here's a uh, nice appropriate winter picture of the engine house ruins. You can see the mine pit in the background all filled with water and the road in the in the upper part is that's Old Bethlehem Pike. Here's some more views around the engine house at different uh, times of year. As you can see it's a, it's a scenic location. So what's next at Freedomsville? I mentioned uh, you know here's what the building looks like today. Uh, not very pretty. And uh, you can see on the right-hand side the, uh, cor the Cornish engine houses, which, as I said, are a UNESCO World Heritage Site, um, some in Australia, some in Mexico, we could go on, Spain, elsewhere, South Africa, they've been preserved and restored. And again, if the Cornish were um, a small place, only about a half a million people, but half of that population in the 19th century moved pursuing, in most cases, mining opportunities around the world. So the connection of Cornwall to the dysphoria of Cornish people is, is, is very strong. For that reason, um, you know, the site really has international interests. We, uh, we have given uh, presentations in Cornwall uh, to the Cornish American Heritage Society uh, here in this country. There's about two million people in the United States who claim Cornish ancestry. Um, most of them don't live in the Lehigh Valley. Most of them live in California, Nevada, Arizona, Michigan, places where they had a mining industry much longer, a hard rock mining industry much longer than we had. Um, but this site is a, because this is the only Cornish engine house that remains, and from a Cornish perspective, uh, an engine house is like a windmill is to the Dutch, right? I mean, it's, it's emblematic of the culture. Because this is the only one that remains in the United States, it's a great interest to them. Um, so much so, I, as uh, Kara mentioned, they decided to make me a bard. Um, but uh, that's my uh, 
granddaughter Evelyn there. She's we took her along for the ride, and that's uh, Damien Nance to the left. Um, so uh, you know, I only mention that because it just just to point out the fact that this is of great interest beyond just the uh, just beyond just our Lehigh Valley. Um, a little gravestone up on the top. That's from a small cemetery. That's at the corner of, corner of Oakhurst and Old Bethlehem Pike. It's not maintained, but it's a corny cemetery. And it's interesting, you go and look at the gravestones and in many of them they wrote from Cornwall on there. And I think that what that shows is that strong attachment the Cornish people have to their homeland, and that's kind of shared the other way where the Cornish people have a strong attachment to those places where their people went off in the 19th century to pursue their, their good fortune. So what have we done to date? I mentioned Lehigh University owns the property. We've gotten grants from uh, the state of Pennsylvania and also from the National Trust. And with those grants and matching funds from Lehigh and others, we've uh, assembled a team of, of consultants. Uh, we've uh, removed a lot of the vegetation from the engine house, although sadly a lot of it is also coming back. Uh, we did a, we've done uh, a number of other structural and architectural assessments as well as renderings of what a, uh, a restored uh, engine house might look like. Uh, Lehigh's connections, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, but Lehigh's connections uh, go back quite a bit with the property. They own it today, and that's because of uh, it was granted to them along with 750 other acres by the Stabler Foundation in 2012. But uh, that uh, Theodore Roper that I talked about in the beginning, he became Lehigh's first professor of mineralogy. So, and if you look at every generation from there on out to present, there's some significant connection between this mine location and Lehigh University. So what we've done today with our consultants is we have uh, done a structural assessment. We did a, uh, a 3D scan where we've actually scanned the building inside and out, 760 million data points. We've been told, I don't know how exactly to prove this, but we can tell if a stone has moved by as much as a 16th of an inch on the building. And what we did with the scan is that has then been used to make engineering drawings which are ready to go uh, when we have funding available to actually restore the house. And lastly, I mentioned uh, we've uh, done renderings of what the uh, restored property might look like. And here it is. This is uh, the engine house restored as a heritage type park or space that people can come and enjoy. Uh, you'll see that there. That is the uh, that is one of the steam. That's the surviving steam boiler drum. And I'll get to that in a moment. But you can see uh, the idea being that you could uh, uh, walk up to the engine house, walk in the engine house. Uh, walk around the engine house, uh, take a look at the, uh, the minefield uh, lake, the, the, and uh, also down into the uh, pump shaft. You can see you can see the uh, pump shaft very clearly, and go inside the engine house. And the idea being that when you're in the engine house, we would put a circular stand that would be the same diameter as the cylinder, so that you can really get a sense of a, where it was and the scale. So I mentioned the boiler. The boiler was in a furniture factory in Allentown. Uh, it just so happened that a guy, a guy by the name of Gottlieb Bueller, who was building his factory in 1901, needed a water tank. And when they uh, scrapped the engine, they didn't scrap the, the, uh, the boilers. Uh, they were obsolete as use of boilers, but they made good water tanks. And so he went over and cut a deal to get one of them. And uh, he, he took it over, it's uh, 30 foot long. He took it over to his new furniture factory under construction, popped it in the basement as a water tank. And this story survived from Gottlieb Bueller to his son, to his son, was passed down through the generations and was found out by a very famous uh, local historian, Lance Mentz. Lance Mentz, maybe you, many of you might know, remember Lance. And then in turn passed on to our historian, Michael Pierce. So when we found out that the building was going to be demolished, um, two years ago, we started a dialogue to uh, get the uh, boiler back. So that uh, that happened here in January. Uh, the first picture up there, you see the uh, 
boiler in the basement, and we had to cut a hole in the floor. There's a guy kind of working on uh, on that part of the project, and then we got the crane in here, and that's the very last bit to get it out the. What we did is we actually took a window and made it into a doorway. And that's it being pulled out. The last little bit we had to get over this concrete lip, which they actually had to chip out to get the uh, to get it out. But uh, there it is coming out, mostly out, and then ready to be loaded onto the trailer. It's 30 feet long, 33 inches in diameter. Made in 1870 in Philadelphia. So there it is on the trailer, ready to go. It's now back down in Saucon Valley in a Lehigh University building, all ready to uh, be restored and then return to the return to the um, uh, site. Uh, just to give a sense of how that would have fit in, you see the head there. You can see this is what it would have looked like when it was in operation at the President Pump. Again, there were 20, actually 22 of these. 20 of them were in operation and two were always on standby because the water's so hard they actually had to descale to. So they had a crew descaling to all the time, rotating on a ro rotating basis. Uh, we were also approved uh, in uh, December 22 for a roadside marker. I think we're all familiar with the blue, Pennsylvania blue roadside markers. We were one of two locations in the Lehigh Valley approved so uh, in 2024, I don't think it'll be this year, it'll be next year, uh, we'll plan to have a roadside marker uh, in front of the engine house gate. Uh, Lehigh needs to do a little bit of work to clean up the property first. It's kind of weedy and not so nice looking. So, so we want to do that first, but then we'll put the sign up, have a little ceremony, and you know, people driving down Old Bethlehem Pike will have a reason to stop. <laughs> So we're going back to Tony Mont's model. And uh, as we close up here, I do hope you decide to go out and take a look at it. Tom, I, was Tom here? Yeah. There he is, Tom's in the back. Our friend Tom, uh, who works here at the museum, has done a magnificent job of getting the engine set up so it can be run on compressed air. That's how it's designed, but uh, it, it, it didn't come quite out of the box knowing how to do that. But, uh, Tom's devised a unique way of running the engine, so you'll be able to go outside and actually see the engine in operation. It runs probably a little more frantically than it really did in life. Uh, because it's a model, it, uh, the beam, walking beams move up and down pretty fast. In real life, it probably ran a little bit more like uh, six to seven revolutions a minute. And there's some other pieces I'd like you to take a look at on the model when you go out there. The world's biggest nut. Now, um, my wife might say that I'm the world's biggest nut, but, um, but and I don't know, maybe, let's talk metal nuts, not mental nuts. Uh, from, a, from a metal nut perspective, one of the uh, things they used to say about this engine when they were trying to portray just how big it was, was that this nut that ties the um, piston rod to the crossbar, at the time, was said to be the biggest nut in the world. Uh, it is brass, made of brass. It weighed uh, 1,600 pounds. It took um, 20, if I got this, according to what the, they say, and the, you know, newspapers never lie, do they? But uh, according to what they say, it took um, 20 men pulling on a 20 foot long wrench to either loosen or tighten the nut. So that's, anyway, take a look at it. You tell me what you think. I don't know. But that's, uh, that was some of the uh, advertising on it at the time. And so if, if, uh, I've been, if this has all inspired you to give money, uh, please don't hesitate. Uh, Lehigh University has a, um, a program. They've uh, set up a fund uh, way out there. They are collecting money for pr preservation. Uh, obviously, we're going to have to have a big campaign to, for the engine house itself. But even small amounts will help do things like try to replace some of the lentils and things that need to be preserved. Um, for those of you who have seen the engine house, you know what desperate condition it's in. So even band-aids right now would be of great, great assistance. And that's uh, acknowledgments, which is long and lengthy, and I have many people to acknowledge. And then don't run off to the site by yourself. Uh, get a hold of me. I'll make arrangements to show it to you. But uh, it is 
heavily marked with no trespassing and there are trips and hazards and it's better if you go with me. And that's me. So, so well, I think that's that's pretty much all I have and I hope I...